I'm Janice Edwards. Coming up on Bay Area Vista, Rick and Wendy Wally took on the adventure and encore career of a lifetime when they decided to leave Silicon Valley and work in Swaziland and Kenya. Theirs is a fascinating story designed to inspire you to follow your passion and purpose at every stage of life. That's next on Janice Edwards Bay Area Vista. Join us. Welcome to Bay Area Vista. I'm Janice Edwards, and thank you for joining us today. Rick and Wendy Wally are the authors of From Silicon Valley to Swaziland, and theirs is an entertaining, fascinating, inspirational story. Both their book and their interview have a call to action for you, so be sure to stay with us through the end of the show to find out more about that. But Wendy and Rick, thank you so much for being with us, and welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're delighted. Well, we're going to take some of that journey virtually with you in just a few minutes, but let's back up. Up. What was going on in your life? What were you doing? I'll start with you, Rick, at the time that led to the decision to really transform your lives in the way that you did. Well, uh, both of our careers had been pretty much entirely in the high-tech industry here in Silicon Valley. And when we got into our 50s, we both started talking about doing something else at some point late in our career, something that was more socially beneficial and helping people. And so Wendy was actually the one that took the initiative and did it first where she went to Junior Achievement and became their Vice President of Communication and Development. And uh, she took a big salary cut to do that. About 50 percent. Yes, 50%. exactly, exactly. But uh, she felt like she was doing something more purposeful and really helping people and pursuing interests in uh, children, in education and entrepreneurship. So a few years later, uh, I got the idea that it was my turn. And I started thinking about leaving the high-tech career that I was on and doing something more interesting and more, as I said, socially beneficial. So that's, that's when I did it. Right. Um, and did, what change did you experience, Wendy, once you left high tech and you were working in nonprofit and doing your achievement? It's a great nonprofit. I can certainly attest to that as well. But what did you experience that was different from what you had endured a, during your high tech career? Maybe not endured, but enjoyed even. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was some endurance. Um, but I would say mostly it was a sense of I was accomplishing something meaningful that really had impact and I could see it. Um, whenever I taught in a classroom or met with people who had volunteered at Junior Achievement, it really felt I was having impact. I had some very long days. It wasn't that I worked a lot less, and it certainly wasn't the salary, but it was inspirational because it had meaning to me. I think that can be the shock sometimes with the nonprofit world. You, you, you have more hours, less pay, but it's, it's those rewards. But Absolutely. So you were doing that, Rick. You were at a high-tech company and decided, I see what Wendy has done. So how did that transform from those stirrings to deciding that you were going to go and live in Africa? Well, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do something with a social benefit, but I didn't know what it was. So I started exploring and I started thinking about, well, at this point in my career, I can do anything. Mm -hmm. And so I thought big. And I thought, well, I'm going to uh, go for world peace <laughs> and uh, world peace by uh, reducing poverty, because I think poverty is a big cause of uh, wars and Absolutely. in um, uh, dissatisfaction amongst different groups of people. And so I started reading, I started networking, I started looking at the web, and I found through my network TechnoServe that had business solutions to poverty as their tagline. And so I had business background and I knew I could contribute right away, and so could Wendy. And so 
To make a long story short, that's how we found TechnoServe. And they also had a volunteer program so that we could get into to that program. So Rick comes home, or he's been doing this research, you've been thinking about this, and he says, I found our place. We're going to Swaziland. Did you know anything about Swaziland at the time? Not a thing. And um, I can tell you that when I first, when we first started talking about living abroad, Swaziland was not at the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Paris, London, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but then when we decided it would be a developing world, I came up with some criteria that had to be met before I would move 10,000 miles away. <laughs> so there were four, mm -hmm. no flying bullets. Good one. Um, I didn't want to go to a country with Stan mm -hmm. in the name mm -hmm. and needed to have flush toilets and hot showers. <laughs> very I important. I thought that, that was pretty liberal. Yes, <laughs> that was very reasonable. And so, yes. so Swaziland was chosen. There was someone there who really needed your services right away yes. with TechnoServe and you packed a lot in backpacks and luggage because oh, you were yeah. going to be gone for six months. Yes. Now, what did your friends think about this and, and your family and your children? I mean, your children are grown, but when you tell them that you're going to go to a foreign country and, and be there for six months, that can kind of shake up the family, yes. I think. Yes, yes. I would say both of our children were pretty enthused and, and sort of launched on their career. Our son had finished law school. Uh, our daughter was in medical school, so it's not like we had to hover and, and take care of them. And they were very enthusiastic about our living someplace where we were going to be in an interesting environment because then they could travel to meet us. <laughs> so that was, that was, the family was, was pretty enthusiastic outside of our children as well. Our friends, I think, had a little concern, thought we may have been a little crazy. <laughs> But they respected us, and they started giving us information. Well, in Swaziland, did you know that blah, 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 blah? Oh, well. So it, they immediately hit the web. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they, it, it, even if they didn't know where Swaziland was, mm -hmm. they went on to the web, and they would call us up and tell us all these facts that they'd researched about Swaziland. Wow, so, that's good. Yeah. A good supportive network yes. community there. And so then you arrived. And what do you remember about those first days of adjustment, starting to understand? I know the, the journalism there left something to be desired, but I, and we'll talk about that. But what do you remember about when you first arrived? Well, I think I was surprised um, at how much Swaziland looked like California. Mm. It, was, it was hilly and it was warm-ish, a um, lot of kind of ups and downs and differences in geography. The city that we were going to be living in was relatively small for what we were imagined a capital would be. It was 100,000 people. But it was um, kind of looking like a town in America, a mm -hmm. small city in America. So it was almost shocking that it was so familiar in some ways. Yes. Rick, what about you? Yeah, it, it was an adventure. So. I didn't know what to expect. We were, we were willing to try anything, do, do new things. And it was shockingly like California in many ways, the, the topography and the geography. Uh, there were eucalyptus trees. The cabin that we stayed in was like a little vacation cabin that you might find in the foothills of uh, Sierra. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of rustic, but it was nice and reasonably comfortable, and uh, it, was, it was fine. And as I say, it was just an adventure, so we were open to whatever. Right. One of the things that you discovered, too, culturally, is because of the large incidence of AIDS, the median lifespan there, the life expectancy is in the 30s right. for most people. And so how did that impact both business and the culture there? Well, in, in many ways, um, the population was very um, fragmented because a whole generation of parents, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, disappeared, if you will, because of AIDS. And so there were a lot of young children to teenagers, and then there were a lot of older generation people who were often taking care of the younger generation. So that was kind of shocking. 
Um, it was also interesting the, the attitude towards HIV and AIDS, and it was not a lot of educated information available, or certainly it wasn't taken as seriously as, I think it has been more recently than yes, when we first got because there. what year was it when you were first there? We were first there in 2006. Yes. And um, at one point when we were doing some research for getting grants for TechnoServe, it was predicted that within a very few years, 20% of the population would be orphan children, mm. which was really disconcerting. Very sobering. Yeah, very yeah. sobering. So, and I, I know you mentioned in your book, too, that there was an official who suggested that men should satisfy their wives <laughs> more to stop <laughs> to stop the problems there. So, and you were a little surprised about... Well, yeah, be, it, and the background for that is the reason that AIDS is such a problem there is because a lot of the adults have unprotected sex with multiple concurrent heterosexual partners. Mm -hmm. And so it spreads AIDS very right. readily. Right. And that's when the prime minister got up in front of parliament and said, the way to solve this is for men to satisfy their wives better and then they'll stay home. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, fortunately, there's been more education since then yes, in terms of yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. When you think about what you learned from a business perspective there, you had the backgrounds that you did, and the company that you worked with through TechnoServe had many needs. So what, what stood out for you in terms of what you were bringing to contribute there? Rick, I'll start with you. Well, the, the, the businesses there are, are very different from what we see here in Silicon Valley. I mean, Silicon Valley, you have a business, it grows rapidly or it fails rapidly. Mm -hmm. If it fails, you sell the furniture, you move out and you get another job in six months. Right. Uh, I worked with one business that had been started initially six years ago and they had struggled along and failed and then they got some more financing and they'd struggled along and they'd failed again and and this was over a six-year period and mm. this just wouldn't happen right. here in Silicon Valley. They would have it was shop and it, figured out something Exactly. Else, like it would have either been successful or they'd have closed it up. So things happened at a very different pace. The the businesses that we were working with were, were tended to be less sophisticated. They were small businesses. Uh, should mention that 75 percent of the world's seriously poor are smallholder farmers. So if you're working with the poor, you're going to be working in agriculture most of the time. So we, we work with a lot of agriculturally related businesses. Yes. Wendy, what was a typical day like, a work day for you there? Well, it, it was surprisingly like going to the office in Silicon Valley, only many of us worked in one room. Mm -hmm. um, I sat next to Rick um, a lot of the time in very close quarters. Um, but it was also like being in a, in a startup environment in, in some ways as well because it was a relatively new organization in Swaziland. TechnoServe had only been there about six months before we arrived in Swaziland. So it was in a startup itself um, and it was Sometimes it was difficult to get onto the internet or to get onto the email because we were sharing a line that would have been small in our own home. Oh. So, I mean, just the infrastructure right. was, was different. But the environment itself felt familiar on a day-to-day -day basis. And but then going received? out mm -hmm. into the you know, local city to do our shopping, that felt very different. How were you received there? The people there were lovely. Mm -hmm. the, our, our office colleagues were, were delightful, generally old enough to, to be our children, and not, if not younger. Mm -hmm. um, we were definitely the oldest people in the, in the office. But it was fun there. It was fun there because it was so young, mm -hmm. and they were so enthusiastic. And the local people were really very interested in learning from us. So it was, it was fun to mentor those the people that we met in the office and the people in the city that we met or in the places that we traveled were very friendly and very warm. That's wonderful. You mentioned you were working side by side very close quarters. So you've been married 44 years. How did this impact your marriage? What did you discover about each other? <laughs> 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 <That's>, 
We probably discovered that it's better not to be together 24 hours a day, <laughs> every day. <laughs> but we Have tolerated space, it. space, right? Exactly. We tolerated it and uh, survived. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I mean, net-net, I think it was actually good for our marriage because we were both focused on the same thing. We were, we were working for the same cause, and we shared ideas back and forth and, and had a lot to talk about. So it... It was good. And so six months came. That was your marker. What happened after six months? Well, at the end of six months, we, we said, well, this wasn't bad. You know, we, we wanted to, to try it out, just dip our toe in the water. And so we told TechnoServe we'd just go for six months. But uh, we said uh, we could do this more, and we felt that we should. You know, we hadn't contributed enough. And so... I went to the uh, vice president of TechnoSurf for Africa and said, we'd like to do this. Well, we could do this for another year, but we'd like to try a different country. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, that sounds great because up in, go up to Kenya because in Kenya, the country director left. He had two deputies. We promoted one to be the new country director for Kenya. We promoted the other one to start up a new operation in Uganda. So they're really thin on experience management up there. So you two go up there and help them out. And um, he, he took the job description for the country director and he put assist in front of every line item and that's what he gave to me for my <laughs> job description. And then Wendy was uh, primarily focused once again on youth programs because of her experience and expertise in, in that area. Right. So Wendy, what did you do in Nairobi? Um, instead of focusing on youth in Swaziland, I focused on youth and young people mm -hmm. in, uh, in Nairobi. So the program, there were three programs that I worked on. One was called Young Women in Enterprise. And that was um, women kind of school-aged into their early 20s who we were trying to teach um, independence and uh, responsibility for their families and for themselves. Now, when you say that, culturally, what does that mean? And, and is that something that re meets a lot of resistance at times? It doesn't meet resistance. It, it is not traditional. I think a lot of times young women get married quite young and then become dependent on husbands who are not necessarily worthy of being depended upon. Mm -hmm. And so they are often stuck in situations where they have to really be responsible for the day-to-day -day livelihood of their own family, but without the skills and without the backing to know what to do to do about that. So the program was really focused on teaching both life skills and entrepreneurship and business skills to these young women. What was Nairobi like com compared to Swaziland? I know bigger, obviously, but culturally, what did you experience? I would say going from a small town, which is what the capital of Swaziland was, uh, with maybe a half a dozen good restaurants, no, um, no movie theaters, very little entertainment outside of going to the cultural village. Mm -hmm. Um, was uh, going to Nairobi was such a huge comparison because like a big city it had all the entertainment, the shopping malls, the kind of um, things that you would find of interest to do lots of different kinds of things. And, and on the other hand it didn't feel as safe. Mm -hmm. It was um, often... Like most big cities. Like yeah. most big cities. Um, but Nairobi did have a nickname called Nairobi. Wow. And it was of concern walking around. Certainly you didn't do that in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, it was fine to walk around in, in the areas that we were um, during the day, but it was, you, you had a different sense, a different tension um, when you were out in the streets. You were just more watchful about who you were with and where you were going. And that included the traffic. Oh, the okay. traffic was terrible. And they have these little, uh, like a Volkswagen bus, mm -hmm. that they call them matatus. They're like taxis that run on, on a route. 
So it's a cross between a taxi and a bus, and the drivers are crazy. <laughs> they, they're, they're nuts. They, they think <laughs> if they waste two seconds, they're going to lose, lose lots of lose money. Lose their place so, in <laughs> Or whatever, yeah. But they're, they're, they're crazy drivers, so you had to watch out for them all the time when you were walking. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And is it, the big potholes were there, too, right? Oh, um, absolutely, yes. Potholes yes. the size of Volkswagens, too. I, I yes, remember yes, you yes, talking yes, about that. Yeah, yes. and right. streets that were two lane, one in each direction, often became four, mm -hmm. five, or six lanes, depending oh. on where people wanted to go and what mm -hmm. they wanted to do in the time of day. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, was, it was quite a challenge. Right. But what did you also learn just about Africa that would defy some of the perceptions or misperceptions that people have? I would say Africa is in some ways much better off than the kind of the standard perception that not everybody is rural and poor and living in terrible conditions. Yes, that is a big part of what is in every country, but there are lots of people who are well-educated, who are entrepreneurial, who are making a difference, and their lives are, are helping to move the country forward. They're very driven to be successful and make their country successful, and they are succeeding, certainly not as much as perhaps they would like, but they've made enormous progress. So I think that's that needs to be corrected in, in terms of the vision of Africa. Yes, that is very important. So you stayed there and then it was time to come back. When you came back to Silicon Valley, how was that reentry? What did you what did you discover about yourselves and how was it different because of what you'd experienced in Africa? Well, I think we got a better perspective on what's important in life. You know, it's it's not necessarily the greatest new app for the iPhone that is the most important <laughs> Don't tell thing. Tell people that, Rick. <laughs> right. You know, in Silicon Valley here, we we live in our own little bubble and we get wrapped up in everything we do and and there's a big world out there, billions and billions of people uh, who are not doing what we're doing here and they're struggling to get by just every day. So I think we became much more conscious of that and more understanding and empathetic with a lot of other people in the world. And that was probably the biggest realization. Um, I would I say know. it was also, it's always about to me about the people and the people that I care about and having the perspective of there were people that I cared about and missed and loved in Africa that I really would love to see again, in many cases we have, as well as the friends that you make here. So there's, people are good people everywhere, I think was an important part of what we learned. We also learned that it was nice to not be 10 time zones and 10,000 miles away from family <laughs> and the friends that we had originally been with, but yes. um, it, was a, it was a wonderful perspective. Yes, and that's what comes through in your book. It's entertaining and also the humanity. And, and it also is a reminder, too, because throughout the Bay Area, there's so much about growth, and yet there's so many people who have suffered loss, too, and are living right alongside that. And so I think that what you talk about, too, just can help people amplify their own understanding both here and wherever they travel. This is an encore career, and for people who don't know how to start that, what advice would you give them? Because you do have a call to action that we promised to tell you about in the book, and that is to figure out, for each person to figure out what you're passionate about. But I'll let you explain more about what you hope will come from this. Well, we wrote the book for a number of reasons, obviously to, to entertain uh, our readers. Uh, but before I went to Africa, I had read A Year in Provence and Under the Tuscan Sun, which are both excellent books. I enjoyed yes. them both. And I saw the movie Under the Tuscan Sun. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but they, they talk about couples our age at the time going to Europe, eating great food, fixing up old houses in Europe. And to me, that just sounded like a pretty indulgent lifestyle. And so I wanted to present a different view, a different story of what you could do at that point in your life that I think would be more beneficial if more people would do that. Yes. And that's the, the challenge that we offer at the end of the book. It's, we're not superheroes, we're not 
particularly special. Anybody can do this. And we had a great time. You know, we, we found purpose, but we also had a, a lot of adventures. And so I think that's the, our message is go try something. Go do something. Uh, do something that's exciting to you, but, but also do something that is going to make you feel good about yourself and is beneficial to society. And speaking of being beneficial, Wendy, the proceeds of the book are all going to TechnoServe. All of the proceeds go to, to TechnoServe to encourage and to support their continued work for um, alleviating poverty in Africa and Latin America. They have, they have programs in Latin America as well. That's incredible. And so how much does it take to really keep a TechnoServe program going? In a particular well, it depends on the size of the program. Mm -hmm. Some are multi-country, so obviously that would take quite a bit more money than, right. <laughs> than, um, than a single country program. But um, one of the biggest programs that TechnoServe had uh, recently was a coffee program that spanned four, and I think actually a fifth country at one point, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, um, and there may have been another another country in there. But su supporting that required the um, Bill Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and mm -hmm. other supporters, Pete's Coffee, Starbucks, you know, to go and buy the coffee. So it's, it's a multi-pronged support system that has to be behind all of these huge programs. And then there are smaller programs. So it really depends on the size of the program, how much money is required. You're right, it really varies well. I want to thank you for bringing us from Silicon Valley to Swaziland. It's a wonderful read, and it's wonderful to know that it's going for such a great cause. And if you'd like to find out more about Rick and Wendy or to contact them, we have the details on our screen, their website, and also how you can get a copy of From Silicon Valley to Swaziland. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. It was delightful. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, oh certainly. My pleasure. Yeah. And we also want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for all that you do to make our Bay Area our Sacramento area, and our world a better place. I'm Janice Edwards. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Our funny experiences, our adventures, like uh, riding on the top of an elephant, and we can tell you that you don't steer, you let the handler drive the elephant. You need to expect that you may get wet, so you need to lift your feet and lift your legs when you're crossing a river, and you need to hang on for dear life.